going to start. Maybe we'll get a few more people that will roll in late. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, good afternoon to this EPC Global Turkey Air, um, event, although it's local Turkey Air, um, today, where we are going to be discussing domestic dynamics in the country, something that's always complicated, I have to say, even difficult to understand for many Turkish people. Um, so for foreigners, it's even more complex um, to understand often what's actually going on in Turkey. I mean, particularly perhaps in this town where there's often more focus on foreign policy than there is on domestic developments in the country. So we're going to be looking at um, the, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the dynamics in the country ahead of the local elections that are slated for 2024. I mean, there always seems to be elections of one type or not in Turkey. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, the different alliances. I mean, what's changed since this year's uh, president, presidential and parliamentary elections in terms of alliances, um, what other alliances could be formed or where are the sort of cracks um, or prospective cracks in some of these alliances and the key players um, in these alliances. And also on a few other issues, for example, the, sit the situation vis-a-vis the Turkish um, economy, which is always a hot topic as well. So I want to welcome both of our speakers, who I'm sure are all quite well known to everybody. Um, first of all, uh, Demir Murat Seyrek, who's adjunct professor at the VUB, uh, un the Univ ULB, University Libre de Bruxelles. Um, he's also a senior advisor at the European Foundation for Democracy. And last but not least, he's an academic fellow here at the EPC. Uh, and then on my other side, Aisha, welcome. It's your first time speaking um, in the EPC. Aisha Urekli, who is a Brussels-based researcher, analyst and commentator, and who previously worked um, in the Berlin office of HUSIAD, the big uh, industrialist and employers association. Um, of, of Turkey. So I want to start off by um, let's have having a look at the analysis of the opposition parties um, today ahead of the elections. I mean, earlier this year, as I mentioned, we had the presidential and parliamentary elections when the opposition um, alliance was hoping for a victory. They were hoping for a change um, in May in these elections. But as we all know, um, this didn't happen. So it would be good to understand better the current situation of the opposition parties, um, as well as the, of the, as the mood of the voters, which is always an important element in Turkey. So I'm going to give the floor, first of all, you, um, Murat, if you can, we don't want to have really long answers because we want to try and make this very interactive, but I'll kick off with you and then come to you, um, Aisha. Uh So the opposition voters were expecting a change and it didn't happen. Uh, so we can even talk about actually a sort of post-election stress disorder. Uh, but we can probably say that this is over by now. Uh, there is still some other problems like depression due to economic policies maybe. But uh, people are a bit uh, more optimistic again. Uh, but also many in the opposition, I think they are less interested in politics because we uh, were really focusing too much on politics uh, before the elections. And nowadays their priorities are also uh, rather different. Uh, probably we'll come to that, but uh, I think both for opposition uh, and for the pro-government uh, voters, probably the priority is the, the situation of economy nowadays. Uh, but there is also this uh, anger in the opposition, and the anger was directed to one person, the opposition's candidate, uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, uh, because people believed that it was lost because of him. Um, it also clearly shows us that that was 
uh, wrong process from the opposition in terms of uh, choosing the, the candidate of the opposition. And he has become, uh, I don't know if you follow uh, Black Mirror, but there was an episode, uh, Hated in the Nation. So Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu was the one hated in the nation. And in a way, the CHP in a rather democratic process uh, elected a new president. And Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu is not there anymore. Uh, we'll probably discuss the consequences of uh, this too. But very, very briefly, I think uh, the opposition side, uh, things are a bit complicated. Uh, there are some positive changes, including the uh, new chairperson of CHP. Uh, but there are also problems, especially in terms of the electoral alliance, because we are uh, going ahead with a new election. In March, we will have rural uh, uh, municipal elections. So, uh, and for these elections, we will probably not have an electoral co uh, coalition and alliance in the opposition. So this is going to be a major challenge. Uh, there are, of course, challenges for the uh, ruling party as well, but uh, especially for the, for the opposition, the main challenge will be uh, how to go ahead uh, for the elections by consolidating mm -hmm. the voters again, and also by creating a new uh, excitement among them as well. Okay. Thank you, Murat. I want to come back to these alliances a bit later, but I now want to give you um, an opportunity to comment um, on how you think, think how you think things have changed um, since the May um, elections. I mean, you wrote a piece before the elections related to the um, opposition, and in fact, many of the things that you wrote about actually um, came true um, post-election. So um, I'd be interested to to hear what you see as the key milestones that have happened since the election. And also maybe you can give us a picture of the profile um, of Mr. Uzgur Uzel. I mean, he's not perhaps so well known in the in EU member states as he is in Turkey. I mean, in many ways, he's a sort of name that popped up um, um, from, no, from nowhere, but he's now leading the party. Um, and maybe you can also say what's happened to Kemal Bey. I mean, what, what does his future hold? I mean, is he just going to um, retire or is he going to try and still be active politically? Okay. Uh, these are all big, big questions. And, uh, Only a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, first of all, uh, I want to welcome everybody. It's, as Amanda said, my first time speaking at the EPC, and I'm very happy uh, to address you, especially now uh, there are only a few weeks until the end of the year, and we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the modern Turkish Republic this year, 2023. And I'm honored to speak, actually, about Turkey uh, in in front of this uh, esteemed audience. And um, coming to the elections and the upcoming elections, um, in uh, uh, the May uh, twin elections, uh, um, I, I agree with Murat, certainly, that uh, there was a huge disillusionment, a despair even, among the elector electorate uh, of the opposition. Uh, and um, I have written before the elections a piece on civil society uh, with the EPC. And after the elections, actually on 1st of August, another piece uh, where the opposition is heading, because there has been uh, a leadership struggle uh, within the main opposition party, CHP, uh, and Ekrem Imamoğlu, uh, the dynamic uh, mayor of Istanbul, has actually started this conversation about change as early as 29th of May, the, the, the next day of elections. He, he uh, submitted like a three minute video telling uh, about the change and calling for change uh, within the CHP. And uh, in this period, uh, since um, summer break, uh, actually CHP was very much focused on this leadership struggle. Uh, and there, uh, as Amanda mentioned, uh, we have, I have predicted uh, in my paper, in my commentary for the EPC, that Özgür Özel uh, could be uh, the person uh, who emerged uh, from this battle between Ek Ekrem Imamoğlu and Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu uh, because uh, Ekrem Imamoğlu has opted for the option to rerun for, for the very important city, Istanbul, maybe the most important city in Turkey, uh, as also uh, economically and business-wise the largest city besides history and being beautiful and big, etc. 
And um, his decision to rerun for Istanbul elections resulted in uh, in the search of, of another leader. And there, uh, the uh, um, Özgür Özel, as Amanda said, maybe not so uh, familiar uh, for the Brussels uh, bubble, uh, has emerged in this uh, battle. And um, he's um, in in his you know his early fifties, like Ekrem Imamoğlu. They are a younger generation of Turkish politicians, and he has been doing uh, politics within G CHP circles um, around uh, fifteen years. He he comes. Uh, he's actually um, by profession um, he he pharmacist as far as I know, and. Uh, but uh, he has been very much interested in local politics first and then eventually uh, gained a secure seat, actually, uh, as the right arm uh, of uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. He was a very close person, a uh, very trusted person uh, for Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. Uh, and, uh, but his ideas, uh, his vision, uh, I believe, it was uh, somewhere in between Ekrem Imamoğlu and Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, so he could have also been selected as the right kind of candidate for the CHP leadership. Uh, at the party congress uh, at the beginning of November, um, he was able to uh, gain the party chair. Uh, it lasted until 3 a.m. in the morning, and it went to a second round. So it was actually a very... Um, hard struggle for Özgür Özal also to secure his seat. And uh, now, as I agree again with Murat, there is a hope, there is a beacon of hope for the opposition, for the main opposition party, a renewed dynamism, as I would say, uh, to, to before the uh, local elections, as just less than four months, they need to like focus on this change agenda and be quick enough uh, to respond to the needs of the electorate to win the um, elections in March. Thank you very much, um, Aisha. Um, Murat, maybe you can tell us, you know, why these elections um, are so important. I mean, I'm guessing it's about resources um, and money. And we know the last time around uh, the ruling um, AKP lost um, key cities. I mean, they lost Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, um, and uh, Antalya. I mean, they lost the set, if I can put it that way. And there's a determination, a very strong determination from President Erdogan um, to win them back, particularly um, Istanbul, because it has special significance. Um, and also, he used to be the, the mayor there as well um, some time ago. So why are these elections so important? Uh, well, there are many cliches in, in Brussels, as you know, and one of them is uh, saying that Turkey is not about Ankara, Istanbul, Izmir, and big cities. But actually, uh, what we call metropolitan cities, including the three and others, uh, equal to more than 75% of the population in Turkey. So actually, Turkey is about the cities. And also when it comes to Istanbul, of course, we are talking about the city uh, almost 50% larger than uh, Belgium, both in terms of uh, uh, in terms of population and uh, around, uh, I think, 14 countries in the EU, they have less populations than Istanbul. So uh, it is a major city with also financial resources. There are so many uh, companies under the municipality as well, because that's how things uh, operate in, in Turkey as well. And that also gives, of course, a lot of visibility. Um, President Erdogan also started his career as uh, mayor of Istanbul. So that's really important. And that was also one of the, I think, uh, fundamental choices of Ekrem Yamamoldo not to go ahead with the uh, CHP chair position as well, because he believes that uh, rerunning and then winning this election would make him the main candidate uh, for the next presidential elections. And I think that's a step towards the next presidential, even if we are talking about more than uh, four years uh, process for that. Uh, but this is going to be probably the team, especially in the uh, main opposition party, 
uh, Ekrem Yomol, the other team. Uh, we're talking about two politicians, as Aisha said. I mean, one is 52, Imamolu, and Oza is 49. I mean, they're relatively young. Uh, not totally young, but at, at least they still represent, I think, a uh, younger part of the society, but also change. And also the major difference between this elections and uh, uh, the presidential elections we had. Uh, for the presidential elections, until very last minute almost, we didn't know the candidate of the opposition. Now the roles have changed. Now we know the candidate of the at least main opposition for Istanbul, but this time we don't know about the candidate of the ruling party. And uh, according to a news by a Jumriyat newspaper a few days ago, AKP has been doing some public opinion polls as well to, uh, to select uh, the best candidate for Istanbul. But also things seem to be quite challenging because Ekrem Yomamol is still a very popular uh, politician in Istanbul. So despite all problems. Um, but I think it's also important to renew hopes because as I mentioned, uh, I think for many in the opposition, they've lost their hopes. Uh, but probably before this elections, we will see again renewed hopes. It's already coming there after the uh, CHP leadership change. Uh, Turkey is, I think, a strange place in that sense. I mean, Turks are operating in different ways. You may think that many nations under these conditions, they, they would have lost their hopes a long time ago, but it doesn't work like this in Turkey. I mean, they still believe in democracy. They still believe in democratic change. And somehow it's a country, what I call a republic of cautious optimism. So people are, again, optimistic about this change. Uh, but of course, it's going to be an uphill struggle because uh, last time the opposition was very successful in municipal elections, uh, but this success was also thanks to an electoral alliance uh, between CHP, the main opposition party, and an E-party, Central Right uh, Nationalist Party. Uh, and in Istanbul, Ekrem Yomol was also supported by uh, Kurdish voters as well. So it is going to be, again, a new balancing act because the e E-Party has already declared that uh, they are not going to join the alliance this time. But also, uh, maybe just to add also for the previous question, we also see a policy change within CHP as well, going towards more uh, social democrat line, actually, uh, which is probably also more in line with the, uh, the DNA of the party, like what they should be. Uh, and that's also one of the, I think, consequences of the new electoral system in Turkey with all these alliances. Uh, all political parties started to be very similar to each other. Uh, and that's also a major risk. I think Özel and Imamoğlu, they are trying to change this. Um, CHP, for example, is trying to reach out to more actively and more visibly to Kurdish voters as well. Uh, there was even a, a big controversy um, many pro-government media was attacking him because he joined the uh, Council of uh, Kurdi Soprano and he kissed uh, her hand and celebrated uh, his sac her success as well. Uh, those uh, symbolic moves are, uh, are seen as a change and he's also trying to be very active. I mean, uh, this duo actually, I mean, we talk about a chair person, but actually we can talk about a co-chair uh, and in CHP. I mean, they are ruling the party together. There are, of course, risk of this because CHP is also a difficult party. It's not an easy party to rule. Uh, whether they will be able to manage this and whether they will be able to consolidate voters uh, for the municipal elections, that will be really the trend for the, for the results of the elections. Maybe a follow-on question to you. I mean, Mr. Imamolu um, has had charges brought against him previously, which are still hanging there. Um, is, is there any likelihood um, that one way or another, he could end up not being part of this race? I mean, what are the chances of that? I mean, he's literally one of the most popular guys in Turkey. Eh? I mean, apart from President Erdogan, of course. Um, so what are the chances of that? I mean, could this, this happen um, prior to the elections or will it just not happen at all? I mean, what's your views on that? Uh, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, is um, 
uh, first of all, maybe starting from uh, from the last thing you said about, about the popularity. Uh, yes, he's the second most popular uh, politician. Actually, today it was published uh, by Metropol, one of the most renowned um, um, survey uh, companies in Turkey. Uh, they shared their results about popularity of popu uh, politicians in Turkey, and the first one by far, certainly uh, President Erdogan. Over long years, he established uh, um, among the electorate a certain level of uh, trust and even love, I would say. And uh, second uh, came uh, Ekrem Imamoğlu, and, uh, who is um, um, not that long, actually, in the uh, political scene. Uh, he has been a Beylikdüzü uh, mayor before, but um, he's, um, we know him actually more or less the wider public since um, 2019, but uh, he has already written a success story and uh, in Istanbul and against Erdogan. Uh, so actually he called uh, particular attention and by his uh, style of being also very inclusive and, um, and also also, um, maybe um, um, um, also less um, uh, less ideological, but more pragmatic leader. He could uh, have uh, he could appeal to, uh, appeal to wider um, parts of the electorate, uh, also beyond the typical CHP voters. Um, and um, as Murat said. Uh, um, alliances, um, um, uh, the alliance structure has made it possible for uh, Ekrem Imamoğlu uh, to use this Istanbul alliance uh, dynamic uh, to receive votes, both from uh, E party voters as well as uh, the pro-Kurdish HDP at that time. Uh, now uh, the alliances uh, seem to have uh, dissolved, at least on the uh, right part, the right wing, uh, the EE party alliance uh, seems to no longer function for this time. Uh, but with the HDP, with the current name HEDEP, uh, there is still possibility of negotiations, which will probably follow in uh, sooner or later. As uh, Murat said, there were already some uh, signals uh, about uh, CHP making some moves towards HDP, uh, HEDEP, uh, and uh, some symbolic moves. But uh, most importantly, the uh, Özgür Özel made, uh, I believe, a historic speech last week. I will come to the uh, <laughs> legal issues. Um, but he made a historic speech uh, in the parliament uh, to the group uh, saying that um, uh, Kurds are less equal in Turkey. Uh, and um, actually the, the ruling coalition's uh, uh, smaller partner, MHP, uh, Mr. Bahçeli, um, has um, already declared that this is a disgrace and uh, that... Um, uh, it's even um, criminal what he did uh, to to say this. Uh, but um, um, let's understand this from another point of view that CHP really is trying to to make a new narrative and to win this uh, vote uh, in March. So uh, I believe they uh, they will um, follow. Uh, not just a social democratic, but rather a socialist, a European socialist agenda, uh, uh, which would also appeal to Kurdish voters, because they really, in Istanbul at least, definitely need these votes. Otherwise, it will be extremely problematic for them to win the elections after E party's decision to uh, withdraw from the alliance and to yield their own candidates all over Turkey. And maybe we'll come to that as well, because uh, whether E party will gain something out of this or uh, it only helps the ruling uh, coalition uh, but with this decision, uh, it remains to be seen. About the legal uh, things, uh, very um, uh, yeah, the, um, the cases are there. 
uh, there is a there is a looming risk actually that uh, legal cases would be uh, used against um, Ekrem Imamoglu. Uh, it is certainly uh, not appropriate also legally to uh, judge about the um, details of the cases because it's in in a legal process. So I wouldn't be able to say here that it is justified or not, but. Uh, everybody agrees more or less, I believe, or it is widely uh, stated that uh, the, the, these cases are extremely politically motivated. Uh, and yes, there is the risk that these cases will be used against him before the elections. But at the same time, due to his extreme high popularity, as I said at the beginning, and uh, the coming second uh, most um, popular um, politician in Turkey. Uh, it, it is also highly costly for uh, Erdogan and the ruling um, party uh, to use these cases against him because they will create a hero uh, out of that. So uh, I think um, the ruling party will um, uh, strike a balance uh, and um, yeah, maybe for this time I stop here. <laughs> I think you also wanted to say um, a word about Mr. Um, Imamolo, and maybe as a follow-up, um, you could also explain why uh, the E-Party, uh, Meral Akshana, decided to quit um, the coalition. I'm guessing this harks back to the actual elections earlier this year as well, and the, let's say some of the disagreements that took place vis-a-vis -vis the candidate. And what this will act will actually mean? Um, I mean, will the E party actually be able to survive um, as a party? Um, and maybe also on this issue of the Kurdish vote, because it seems to me, um, whichever elections we go into, the Kurds always seem to end up being labelled the kingmakers. Um, could this potentially be another situation where both? the alliances, because obviously the alliance of the AKP and the, the MHP, which we'll get to in a minute, is also going to try and reach out. Um, and the, the Kurds aren't just one group anyway. I mean, there's lots of fractions there. So I'll give you the floor, Murat. Um, maybe I'll very briefly start about the legal case as well uh, and go a bit more in detail so that you can actually uh, say if it's justified or not. Uh, basically, the last municipal elections uh, Istanbul election was cancelled by the Supreme Election Council by saying that there are irregularities. We don't know exactly what sort of irregularities. And following this, there were a rerun of the election. And the first election was won by uh, Mr. Imamol with 13,000 uh, difference. And then the second one was won with 806,000 difference. Uh, but also Imamol said something there. Uh, accusing the, the members of the um, Supreme Election Council that this is an act of foolishness. And the reason for two years and seven months in prison is as a result of this word, act of foolishness. Um, going back to uh, Imam Oldu very briefly, I think because he also initiated actually the, the process of change, because following the elections, he had this manifesto of change where he said that we cannot behave as if nothing has happened and we cannot insist on the mistakes of the past. I think this also was about the, how the opposition and how the CHP has been uh, acting in the, in the last even 20 years or more, actually. Uh, because it's very clear that these elections were not really... Uh, I mean, they were lost by the opposition because there were all conditions probably in any country, uh, despite all other problems maybe, but all, in any country an opposition, uh, considering all these problems, in, including economic problems, would be able to win these elections, but it was not succeed because uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu insisted to run as the candidate of the opposition. So, uh, but what is different for Ekrem Yumamol is that I think Turkish voters, they like the profile of winners. That's also why probably President Erdogan is very popular because he has this winner uh, profile. That's the, that's the image among the electorate. And I think slowly 
Ekrem Yomomoli is also building this. Like he won two elections already in Istanbul, including the rerun. Uh, he did what he wanted to do within CHP against uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. And I must say that this was not an easy process because we usually talk about democratic problems in Turkey, but there are also democratic problems within the opposition too. So within CHP, we cannot really talk about a good inner party uh, democracy. So it was very challenging despite all uh, failure uh, in the elections. It was very challenging process, but Ekrem Yomoglu managed to uh, change the dynamics of this as well. So if he wins again in Istanbul, that's why I think he will be the an obvious uh, the candidate in the in the next presidential as well. Uh, for the E party, of course, it's a it's a curious case because the party was established uh, basically before Turkey uh, changed the system from parliamentary to presidential, and the party actually has never run as a single party uh, in all those elections. There were always electoral uh, alliances. And the last one, it was very clear that uh, Mary Lakshner, the leader of the party, was extremely unhappy about how the uh, the process was managed because the party was against uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu and uh, they wanted actually Ekrem Yomomolu or Ankara Mayor uh, Mansur Yavaş to be the presidential candidates and potentially yes, they would have a better chance of uh, winning the presidential elections as well. That's why there is a big anger within the party uh, and they don't want to continue uh, making the same mistakes. But I believe that this is not a definitive decision. I mean, they had second time approved in the board uh, two days ago that they are not going ahead with electoral alliances, but it doesn't have to be an electoral alliance. I mean, we can also talk about some uh, local corporations as well, because it also depends on the city. For example, you mentioned the Kurdish vote. Yes, there are cities where you need Kurds, that's for sure, like in Istanbul, for example. Mm -hmm. But then in Ankara, then you need more nationalist parts. So it really depends on the city. And it can still be in the benefit of e-party as well to cooperate in certain cities. But, and most importantly, I believe that opposition voters, they are also... Uh, very uh, influential in this process. I mean, it happened before, like, for example, Mary Lakshanar even left the table, uh, table of six before uh, deciding on the uh, opposition candidate. And she had to go back because there was a huge pressure. And I believe that in the coming months, both within the E-Party, and there are all, already many voices coming uh, within the E-Party saying that it's a mistake, but also general public opinion, there will be a pressure on E-Party to go back and cooperate with CHP. So we may still see that. Or alternatively, I believe that uh, by now, Turkish voters are also very experienced in this uh, democracy game. Uh, so they may also uh, go around and consolidate their votes around uh, the most popular candidates, which can be Imamol in Ankara, Yavash in, uh, in uh, Imamol in Istanbul, Yavash in Ankara, and we'll see the, the other cities as well. So. Uh, this is certainly, even without an electoral alliance, this is not an end game for the for the opposition, but it's going to be a bit more complicated this time. Okay. Thank you, um, Murat. Do you agree, Aisha, that um, the E party could potentially go back? And what about the other parties? Um, I mean, from this table of six, are they still in the game? And maybe um, you could also say a word about strategy. Um, of the opposition, what's going to be the main strategic message that they're going to be using? I mean, as you're right, I mean, it depends on the city. But let's say um, in the big guy in Istanbul, I mean, what are going to be what's going to be the key strategic messages that they're going to be using? Um, actually, I also forgotten to answer the question before, so I'll just uh, say a few words about Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. Although he's uh, now history, uh, he lost the chairmanship, uh, but he has opened uh, some offices and uh, he's still around, actually, and some people from within CHP still uh, support him. And uh, so in case of uh, electoral defeat, especially losing of Istanbul, uh, there will probably also huge problems within the CHP and Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu and his um, status quo people will probably reappear. 
uh, in the scene. So uh, actually, um, Özel, İmamoğlu and Co, they are um, um, running an election, not just a local election, not just against the ruling, uh, ruling alliance, but also uh, to the... Um, opposition within the opposition so it's it's a challenge at at many levels uh, to overcome and uh, so as you said they need a very good strategy to beat that and uh, but they are also very ambitious both of them both Özgür Özel and Ekrem İmamoğlu you can tell also because that they are young and dynamic uh, but they are also not uh, so much ideologically blinded and they are very eager to win these elections so i also believe in the for the case of e party uh, especially Ekrem Imamoğlu uh, had um, uh, very close relations with E Party, and that uh, also Mansur Yavaş, both um, um, Metropol um, um, um, I'm mayors. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I'm I'm I'm a German of uh, Turkish descent, so sometimes I I think of German words and. Uh, um, um, therefore, I make some pauses. Uh, but um, both Imamoglu and uh, um, Yavaş, they had a very, very good relationship with E party. Uh, but now, uh, and vice versa, uh, as uh, Meral Akşener left the table, uh, beginning uh, of March, uh, and then she had to return, as Murat said, uh, due to the um, uh, pressure, public pressure coming from the voters and media. Um, they became a vice president candidates, both of them. And now E Party, if they really continue uh, with this uh, decision uh, to run on their own as they call it, uh, freely and independently. Uh, if they... <laughs> okay. Give it a bit away. away. Okay. Um, uh, if... Uh, I'm a rookie <laughs> with That's the mic. <laughs> um, if, if they um, um, decide uh, to uh, continue with this uh, um, idea of running freely and independently, uh, probably they won't be able to, first of all, win any big cities, maybe some districts. And uh, secondly, um, um, they will, uh, they already so many people, so many important names have resigned from a party. And it seems they will lose all the, uh, all the good people at the end of this process. And um, maybe most importantly, uh, as you both mentioned, uh, also the electorate, they are expecting another win. And uh, so um, the responsibility of not winning Istanbul or Ankara is very high. And if this stays like that, E party will have to carry this responsibility because CHP has already made the move. Özgür Özel went to her. He was extremely respectful to uh, Meral Akşener and E party. And even after this decision to eat their own candidates on Monday, um, he was speaking yesterday to the parliamentary group and he said E-party voters are good people. Uh, they have uh, similar ideas about Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and the best of our country. So actually the, he was uh, mentioning and uh, warning his uh, other CHP colleagues not to say, not to make any negative uh, propaganda about E party because of that decision, because even if institutionally this alliance cannot occur due to some reason, uh, at people's level, at the polls, uh, CHP is eager to get E party's votes uh, and they really need it. And this same goes also for the Kurdish votes, I believe. Uh, though Kurdish votes are, as you said, divided, not all Kurds vote for uh, HDP HDP. Certainly a lot of them also vote for AKP and the ruling alliance. Okay, thank you, Aisha. Um, I do want to take some questions, but I just want to come back to you for a second, Murat, because we can't go to the questions until we've looked at the other um, alliance, um, the AKP, MHP. Um, alliance. I mean, in the news in the last few days, 
Um, we've seen there's been some disagreements uh, between um, President Erdogan and uh, Mr. Devlet Bacheli. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the constitution, it seemed like uh, President Erdogan wanted to amend the constitution to change it from this 50 plus one um, to something else. Maybe you could elaborate a bit on this. Um, and um, Devlet Bacheli said no. Um, so how watertight is this People's Alliance, as it's called? Um, what can we expect for, from them? And one, when we've heard your response, we'll go to the floor. I mean, I think there is a major gap between the perception in Brussels and reality on the ground when it comes to um, Turkey in many issues, but including uh, President Erdogan and uh, the ruling uh, alliance as well. So the perception here is that everything is very easy for them and President Erdogan is powerful and he can do whatever he wants. Um, it is true to a certain extent, but probably he would have wished also that things were as easy as it looked from a Brussels perspective. Uh, things are not that easy. Uh, I mean, previous municipal elections uh, were a proof of this, and this one will be uh, rather challenging as well, but also May elections, it was not uh, an, a very easy process either. And one of the fundamental problems nowadays is also this electoral alliances. Uh, because with the presidential system, actually, President Erdogan made himself a bit dependent on these alliances too, because you need 50% plus one. And that's not an easy one, because uh, in the first election, for example, in 2002 with the AKP, uh, even 34, 35% was enough uh, to be the prime minister of Turkey. And now he needs more than 50%, and he needs... MHP. First, he needed MHP. And then in the previous elections, he also had to cooperate with two more uh, small parties, uh, one Turkish Islamist, one Kurdish Islamist party. We can divide in this way. Uh, and of course, he's also dependent on them sometimes while deciding. We see the, their influence in policymaking as well, especially, of course, the MHP, the Nationalist Party. Uh, they are always uh, putting more pressure uh, towards certain policy lines. That's also why it's very understandable that uh, President Erdogan would like to amend the system. Uh, and his, uh, his proposal was changing this 50%, uh, more than 50% rule so that there are no more two, uh, two rounds in the elections. And in the first round, whoever uh, is the first one would win the election. Of course, in that case, uh, AKP or President Erdogan wouldn't need electoral alliances, wouldn't need to give concessions, and wouldn't need to rule the country by also uh, negotiating with uh, electoral partners either. And of course, this was rejected by MHP leader Bahçeli, and actually in a very uh, aggressive way. Uh, he also said that this is one of the fundamental elements for the democratic uh, element in the system. Uh, but in practice, of course, he rejects this because actually this makes AKP uh, sort of dependent on MHP. So that gives the entire power to MHP because MHP is a, as a party without taking any political risk, without even actively campaigning, they are sort of in power. Um, they have their guaranteed around 10%. And with that, they are really uh, sort of having a say in so many policies uh, they have uh, pro MHP people working in bureaucracy in many other places as well. So that's a very beneficial gain for them. Uh, there is this problem, and it's not a new problem. I think uh, for for President Erdogan, it is a headache from time to time, probably because he wouldn't want to negotiate everything, obviously, uh, with Devlet Bahçeli. But uh, this is not going to prevent at least their uh, electoral alliance for the municipal elections. As far as I understand, uh, they won't include this time these two small parties. Um, Mr. Bachil was also very unhappy about actually uh, their inclusion in the, in the alliance last time. Uh, but seeing that how tight the elections uh, were, especially for presidential, probably it was also needed. Uh, but the dynamics are different, of course, for municipal elections, and it will be an alliance between AKP and nationalist MHP. Um, and of course, we'll see, like, uh, 
to what extent MHP will, will get what, what they want because they are also quite demanding in this sense. <clears throat> so probably uh, they will have uh, some big cities and important ones as well. They are already negotiating this, but uh, I mean, in general, <clears throat> I will just conclude. We can also maybe talk about other things because, okay, um, President Erdogan is back in power, he won the elections, uh, but things are not that easy, not only politically, but also in terms of economic policy as well. Uh, if there are questions, we can discuss this because that's the priority for many Turks uh, nowadays. And as long as uh, government cannot really provide a solution, uh, it's going to be challenging for municipal elections. And it seems that since the elections, things are unfortunately not getting better. Uh, but worse. Okay, maybe we can come back to the economy in a second, um, but maybe one of the um, guests in the room actually has a question about the economy. All right, so if you can tell us your name and where you come from. Yes. Uh, my name is Ahmed Chan. Uh, I work at TOBB and I'm a student at Bayoube in here in Brussels. I have two questions, if it's okay. Uh, my first question is for uh, Ayşe Yürekli. Uh, how would you uh, evaluate uh, Özgürsel's performance so far, especially uh, when we consider uh, he arrived during this big uh, constitutional court crisis? Good question. Right. Uh, and my second question is for uh, Demir Matsalikli. Uh, as, you, as we all know, there's a clear disenchantment uh, from politics all over Europe, not just in Turkey, especially in Turkey with the last elections, obviously. Uh, do you expect a low turnout rate uh, in the upcoming elections? And do you expect a shift to parties like uh, Zafar Party or uh, Yenda Refah Party? Uh, yeah, basically that. Thank you. Do we have another question anywhere at this point? Yeah, yeah. Ricardo? Yeah. Can I have a follow-up? Yeah. Ah, let's go first, please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Zebru. I'm a doctoral researcher at Freie University at Brussels. And uh, part of my PhD work is related to the uh, myths and uh, pa patterns of the Turkish national identity. So my question will be about that. Um, so we all know that the Turkish government has been imagining and constructing a particular mainstream way of uh, Turkishness and a desired citizenship, which is actually the case since the foundation of the Republic. And um, do you maybe follow any national education reforms with regards to that? Um, what kind of a nation is exactly being um, created through those uh, traditional educational methods? And uh, linked to that, what is the position of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk in this uh, nation creation? Uh, because I'm still unsure if it is completely disregarded or um, located in some ways. Thank you. Question was a little bit on voter, voter turnout. I would be interested to understand first from the from between uh, elections in May, how was uh, young people's uh, voting? So you know where did young people vote, and the f and whether the fact that uh, both I mean Ozel and Imamolu are young leaders, much more younger than any of the others, does this add actually as an effect in terms of, of voter turnout, in terms of motivating the younger generation to vote? Starting from the very last question, uh, and also um, combining this with the very first question, uh, I believe that um, the um, the young population, the youth, is uh, now extremely important for the CHP, for Özel, for Imamoğlu, in their strategies. Um, they have been in the uh, twin elections in May, but uh, um, they will be even more important now in the local elections and ahead uh, for also uh, 2028. Because I think both leaders, they have in mind also this this uh, next uh, general elections uh, in five years or four years, uh, four and a half years. Um, I, I believe uh, the the recurrent team uh, of Zaz's uh, first month, because he has been elected only uh, beginning of November uh, as a chairman, uh, is uh, first of all this this emphasis on youth, 
uh, which is uh, very exciting for Turkey because that this has not been that much in forefront. Uh, for example, uh, in the party organs, uh, now in, in two most important party organs, the average age is 40 something. In one, it is 43, in the other, 46. And uh, this is really interesting. And even uh, more uh, interesting, I find, is the emphasis on women. Uh, this is also very particular for Turkey and for uh, for the um, politics, which is very much male dominated, and uh, like in many other countries as well. By the way, it's not just a Turkish phenomenon. But uh, now, um, for the very first time, CHP uh, under Özgür Özel has a shadow cabinet, and they have uh, uh, the shadow cabinet is. Um, based on gender parity. So half women, half uh, men. And uh, this is uh, really revolutionary in the sense. Um, and um, actually, um, uh, it, it's not just the 100th uh, anniversary of the Republic, but it's also the 100th birthday, the 9th of uh, um, in a, a September. Uh, for for uh, CHP, uh, it's it's one of the oldest political parties, and uh, it has its own traditional ways as well. Uh, also being male dominated, etc. Uh, they want to um, um, perform this vision, this strategy of uh, starting the revolution from within the party ranks. So the emphasis on youth and women uh, is. Um, is a very, very strong uh, dimension of this elections uh, ahead. I mean, I think participating in elections and voting is one of the favorite sports in Turkey. So uh, I expect that it's also going to be the case in the municipal elections. Uh, of course, there is high level of disappointment and uh, some people following the May elections, they were saying that, OK, I'm not going to deal with politics anymore in this and that. Uh, but we will come to a point probably starting from uh, January onwards, people will get motivated again and they will be uh, involved in this process. And young people are especially important and especially important for opposition because according to many surveys, uh, we see that uh, popularity of the opposition is actually higher. Uh, among younger people. Uh, but also their uh, active participation, I believe, is very important for the future of democracy as well. Uh, they are not only voting, but uh, they are also acting as volunteer observers as well. That's a very fundamental element. In, in May elections, around 500,000 young people, they worked voluntarily the election day for the uh, monitoring, election monitoring. That's an incredible number. I mean, uh, in Belgium, you cannot even find 500,000 people to really <laughs> to care about politics and act something, act for something together. And that's also the case in, in many other countries. So that is a reason for major hope as well, because they are not only interested in politics, unlike uh, many other young people in, in the Western Europe. Uh, but they're all also doing things uh, for change. So this is an important element. Uh, but about, for example, parties like Zafar Party, who is like an anti-migrant populist party, and uh, Yenidan Refah, who is a, a sort of neo-Islamist, but also sort of populist party, because they have all these ideas about like anti-vaccine and everything. Uh, I mean, they are not so different, actually, when we compare them with their uh, Western European equivalents in terms of the discourse they use, especially for the anti-migrant discourse. Uh, and more polarization we see in politics, very similar to Western Europe, we also see that such parties uh, gain more support as well. But there is a major difference, I believe, between uh, the national elections and the municipal elections, because uh, here, things are much more local, actually. People really care about how people would run their cities. Uh, and they usually consolidate around vote, uh, around candidates. Uh, they believe that they can do this better. So uh, there can be exceptional cases in certain cities or neighborhoods, maybe. Uh, but may especially in the metropolitan cities, I don't believe that they would have a major success. Uh, 
but of course it also depends uh in istanbul for example again we are talking about municipal elections but uh in the last municipal elections it was a part of the debate for example what do we do with the with the refugees uh, migrants in istanbul so it will come to the agenda for sure and people in turkey they really care about this i mean if economy is number one issue uh migration and refugees definitely number two so this will be used and abused uh for sure should i also say a few words about education maybe or um yeah that's a second um, question yeah just hang a second you can say a few words about education <coughs> but i just wanted to check if we have a last question anywhere in the room no otherwise in addition to the education maybe i can put the last question because we didn't touch on it and i think it's important um, and it's about the economy. I mean, we probably need a whole entire meeting for that. But maybe if you could both give like two minutes to sort of assess, um, I mean, the, the progress that's been made by Finance Minister Mehmet Shimshek and his, let's be honest, um, very orthodox team, as well as the central bank team. I mean, is the economy going in the, di in the right direction um, or not? Um very very briefly about uh, the, the question about the education uh of course it's the case that almost every government in turkey they tried to change the education system in turkey so it was probably amended tens of times uh within the uh, case of 100 years uh but of course this government wanted to bring in more conservative elements to it uh, and changed also probably in a way that to create a new generation uh, but such attempts, I'm not sure if it's really creating also the expected results. In some cases, it also backfires. Uh, maybe this is also one of the cases, even though we can talk about a more conservative, for example, education, uh, less emphasis on positivism. Uh, we see that according to many uh, surveys, uh, for example, deism in Turkey is on the rise. People are becoming deist or atheist, many young people. Uh, so even though they want to create a new generation who is uh, much more religious, which is not really uh, uh, happening. So that's uh, uh, that's one of the major points. For the economy, um, of course, Aisha worked for the Turkish Business Association, so maybe uh, she's in an ideal position to say a few words. But uh, just to give you maybe some numbers, uh, because uh, also people elected, re-elected uh, President Erdogan because they were not sure whether the opposition can solve these problems. Um, they had maybe certain doubts, but at least uh, they knew Erdogan and they believed that, okay, if he did it in the past, maybe he will be able to deliver uh, this again. But since the elections, while there are some positive steps, which started with the appointment of the, the minister, uh, Shimshek and the new economy team around him, and there are some uh, steps in the right direction, we don't actually see good results, at least so far. Um, the day Mehmet Shimshek was appointed, the inflation rate in Turkey was 38%, official one. And now it's 62% according to the official uh, figures of the uh, Turkish Statistics Institute, 74% uh, according to Istanbul uh, Chamber of Commerce, and 129%, according to ENAC, it's an independent institute. Uh, when he was appointed as minister, one euro was 22.5 Turkish lira, and today it is 31.5 Turkish lira. Um, of course, he's doing certain things right, and one of them is changing this unorthodox uh, economy policy because uh, it was believed that by the former uh, former minister that by decreasing the interest rates, you would actually decrease the inflation. So they've changed this dynamic. Now they're increasing the interest rates. So the rates increase from 8.5% to 40%. The expectation that the increase will, will also continue. And there are also many attempts to, to bring in uh, investments to Turkey, especially the minister is uh, very actively looking for investments in the, in the Gulf region. But the fundamental problem, I think, when it comes to economy, um, you need to do some other fundamental things if you want to improve economy. Uh, one point is, of course, predictability. And we, we still have major issues in terms of that. Another thing is rule of law. 
and the perception of rule of law as well, especially by the international companies, multinational companies and other countries. Uh, the level of democracy, the level of education. So as long as Turkey doesn't invest in all these areas, uh, it will be a difficult game actually to improve economy. So it can be Mehmet Şimşek or it can be anyone, even the best uh, finance minister uh, coming from an EU country, if you put as a finance minister in Turkey today, it would be a mission impossible because you need to make some structural changes in the system so that investors would see the country again as an attractive country. So uh, that's the fundamental problem. Otherwise, I think all elements are there. Turkey is still a very dynamic country. Turkey is still a country with uh, very active in production. Uh, it's still an, an important place in terms of uh, trade, uh, producing a lot. Uh, young people are there, uh, even though some of them are leaving the country with the brain drain, that's also a problem. Uh, but even there, I think many of them are actually ready to go back when their ideal uh, conditions are there. So I think conditions are there, but we need to have some structural changes for improvement. All right. And very last point to you, then I'll let everybody everybody leave. Um, what Murat just said about the need for the return to um, a more effective rule of law and whatnot, um, isn't this then a very good case um, within the framework of Turkey e relations? Um, to, to move towards the modernization of the customs union, which is something that Turkey and the EU both want. And within this process, it would require reforms in, in certain sectors. Wouldn't this be the sort of optimal way to bring about reform while at the same time boosting both Turkey and the EU's economy? This question I wasn't expecting, <laughs> but uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, first of all, uh, I cannot agree more uh, with Murat, and thank you for all these numbers. I think it's, it was a, um, a precise summary of the whole situation. Uh, as Murat also mentioned, for the economic uh, kind of problems, it is uh, the most important dimension that the structural issues are addressed. And... Um, um, most of all, uh, most important of them uh, would be the rule of law situation. Certainly, uh, any investor coming uh, from abroad uh, will base their uh, investment decisions um, also uh, on the rule of law. So having a very good minister uh, with a extremely... Um, a good credential and uh, he's also respected um, in the country and abroad certainly helps uh, and also uh, i want to also underline that we have for the very first time a woman uh, a central bank governor which is um, as a, a woman also a proud moment uh, and uh, seeing this um, well-educated team at their work traveling the world um, searching for um, new investments for turkey is uh, definitely the best thing to go to do uh, but uh, unless the structural problem problems would be addressed uh, it will be um, uh, not yielding enough results. Um, and um, in that sense, uh, when we come to the customs union modernization, since we are also in Brussels, and the issue will be discussed actually next week in the, uh, in the next European Council. Also, we are hoping, uh, based on the Borel report, maybe some positive signs um, about uh, the um, um, restarting, um, reinitiating the negotiations on customs union modernization. And um, um, I believe to address uh, Turkey's uh, problems, uh, economic problems, uh, as well as uh, the issues uh, between Turkey and the EU, uh, it is extremely important to go back to a positive agenda and um, uh, customs union modernization will, in that sense, uh, be the very uh, best first step to go ahead, uh, especially also including, um, since the, the agreement dates back to 1995, as some of you might already know, uh, it is history. I mean, nothing in trade or economy has remained the same so long. So it definitely requires a modernization, an update, uh, also including the current agendas, 
which are also very important for the European economy, green and digital twin uh, transformations, uh, and including also the necessary dispute resolution mechanisms that are lacking in the current agreement. Uh, this is the way to go also to help the Turkish economy, uh, but not just that, it will be a win-win situation because all the impact assessments so far show also that the EU countries, certainly some more than the others, but they will benefit also from the modernization of the customs union. So this would be a visionary way to go actually. And uh, maybe on a hopeful note uh, that next week, the European Council will also think like that and decide upon that. Thank you. It's always good to end on a hopeful note. And I agree, it will be very nice if Borel's recommendations are read and everybody says, excellent, you know, let's adopt all of these recommendations. That would be the best news. Um, but it doesn't usually happen. Yeah, but one never knows in this new <laughs> geopolitical um, environment we're all living in. Um, we finished our time today. I would like to thank both Aisha and uh, Murat for joining us today and really giving us a deep delve um, into domestic politics in Turkey, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, um, the forthcoming local elections. This certainly won't be the last event we'll be doing vis-a-vis -vis those elections. I'm sure we're going to have many more um, as part of our Global Turkey project. We don't have any more events this year, um, but you can be sure that as from January 2024, we will be immediately kicking off with some exciting ac activities related to Turkey's foreign and domestic politics. It's rather like a Turkish soap opera. Um, it goes on and on and on, and all the episodes are very exciting. So I wish you all a good afternoon and a good end to the year, actually, because we're getting near to the um, holiday period. Thank you for joining us today uh, and looking forward to seeing you at our next activity in the EPC. Thank you.